Okay, so we might as well get started. Um, we have two TAs that we want to introduce to the class. Uh, we have four TAs for the class. You met two of them the first day, Kevin and Shiva. And uh, two more got back from their internships, and now they're here to serve you as your TAs. So uh, Aditya, would you want to stand up? This is Aditya. And you gave a recitation yesterday. And this is Wu Yang, the other TA. So now you know all the core staff. Um, all right. Any other announcements? I guess that was it. So a reminder, you have a homework coming up. And after that, you have a proposal coming up. We'll get you some more details on the proposal sometime soon about what, what format that should be in. Jeff gave you kind of a rough idea of the format, but we'll probably get you something more concrete soon. Um, last thing is about the noise level in here. So we, we got emails saying that it's hard for people to hear because of the air conditioners. Can everyone hear my voice? Is, is everyone OK with how loud I'm speaking? Or No? OK, I'll try to speak louder. I don't, I don't usually project my voice very well, but I'll try to speak louder, given that there's 120 people in here. We'll, we'll, uh, if I'm speaking too soft, just wave your hand or something if you can't hear me, and that'll be fixed. OK, so today we're going to go back to gradient descent. I know you've probably heard this topic, I think, three times now. So you're like, oh, come on, let's just move on with it. But today we get to actually prove a cool thing about gradient descent. We get to actually prove its convergence rate under a couple of different conditions. And uh, it's going to be our first lecture in this sequence of lectures on first order methods. And uh, it's going to really set up the rest of the lectures um, so that by the end of next Thursday, Thursday of next week, we're going to have our first kind of cutting edge algorithm for solving uh, not, not even continuous optimization problems. I'm sorry, not even differential optimization problems. By next Thursday, we're going to have a method that's, that will allow us to solve um, non-smooth optimization problems at the optimal rate. So we can actually prove that it's the best you can do if all you're, you're willing to look at is a reasonable class of information. So we're going to move through that stuff pretty quickly, and it's going to start with gradient descent. So what was that? Um, Jeff introduced gradient descent a couple times, but I'll just uh, repeat what that was. Let's suppose we have some function that's both convex and differentiable. So today we're going to assume that it's differentiable. We're going to relax that assumption on Thursday. But today we're going to assume that f is differentiable. It's convex. And we want to solve this problem. We want to find a value of x that minimizes f over rn. So there's no constraints here either. That's another thing to, to notice. So solving this problem just means finding an x star that achieves the minimum. And we had this very kind of intuitive algorithm called gradient descent. And all it used was the, the, inform, all, the only information it used was the gradient of f at each iterate that we're at. So we start off with a guess, x superscript 0. This could be 0. That's perfectly reasonable. And then we're going to repeat the following steps. We're going to look at our current guess. We're going to evaluate the gradient at our current guess. We're going to multiply that by some real number, t. And that t has to be non-negative, tk, which means that we're going to move in the direction of the negative gradient. So we're going to go at our current iterate. We're going to move in the direction of the negative gradient. And then we're going to update that to be our, our next guess. And we're going to stop at some point. We can't continue this forever. Then we would never actually have an answer. And we're going to learn today when we would stop. Um, although this point, uh, when, when to stop is really uh, an issue that comes up in practice, and it's, it's really dependent on what problem you're looking at. So I think that you'll have some good experience with the homework and, and future homeworks about how to stop these iterative algorithms, and we'll give you some general suggestions. But it's important to remember that the stopping criteria is very problem dependent. OK, so I think last time I told you I'm going to stop banging you over the head with convexity, but I'm never going to stop. I lied. Um, here's a picture. I, I just uh, made some smooth, funky surface in R2. And I ran gradient descent, looks like, four times. And I don't know if you can see this. That was not what I wanted. I tried to zoom in, but I didn't work. So I, I ran gradient descent four times. OK. And at each of these circled locations, we're a starting point, or five times here, rather, sorry. And you can see that depending on where I started, I ended up at a different spot. Right, so there are, there are at least two local minima here that we can see, probably more, or maybe not even local minima. The, uh, the red and the orange curves actually go off of the plot. They continue in that direction. 
So depending on where we go, right, the negative gradient pushes us downhill in terms of this picture. We would have ended up in different spots because this, this function is not convex. Okay, and, and look, I started actually the purple one and the orange one quite close. And the orange one took me all the way down here. And the purple one took me all the way down there. And what happens if I actually started at somewhere in the middle and I got really unlucky? What would have happened if I ran gradient descent at a really unlucky spot between the purple and the orange? It would have stayed there, yeah. So this is actually a continuously differentiable function. So the gradient pointed this way at one point and pointed that way at one point. And actually, at one point along here, it was 0. And if I started the, the descent algorithm there, I would have gone nowhere. So that wouldn't have been very good. So what's an interpretation for gradient descent? This is going to be helpful in the future when we learn um, non-smooth methods, but it's also a nice way of viewing gradient descent. Why do we think that what we're doing is right? So at each iteration, let's suppose that x is our current iterate. We're going to consider this expansion. We're going to approximate f, our function, at an arbitrary point y by a quadratic around f. So we're going to approximate it by f of x. x is our current iterate plus the gradient at f, the inner product of this with y minus x. This is the linear term based on the gradient. And then we're going to add a term that looks like 1 over 2t times the, the norm between y and x squared. So whenever I, in the future, whenever I don't include a subscript on the norm, I just mean the L2 norm, the Euclidean norm. So this, every time I just do these double bars with no subscript, it's always Euclidean. OK, so what is the interpretation for that? Well, this is kind of like a quadratic expansion, right? But we've replaced the Hessian matrix, uh, delta or nabla squared of f, with an identity matrix times 1 over t. So it's kind of like a quadratic expansion, except for we've regularized the Hessian in a way. And what have we done? Well, we said that we want to actually look at two terms. This is a, is a linear approximation to f, right? This first term here. The second term is a proximity term to x, our current iterate. So if we minimize f of y over all y, it's saying, well, we want to be close to f of x because of that linear term. I'm sorry, this is saying that we want to approximate the function around x. And this is saying that we don't want to move too far away from x. Right? So now you can see that what happens if t is really, really small? That proximity term gets multiplied by a really, really large weight. And if we minimize this approximation over y, we're not going to move very far away from f of x because we're placing a lot of weight on the proximity term. So let's suppose we just choose the next point to minimize this quadratic approximation. So this is a very simple calculation. I just want to minimize f of y or let's call it f hat of y, which is equal to f of x <clears throat> plus the gradient of f of x inner product with y minus x plus 1 over 2t times the prox term. Right, so this looks like uh, the cross product between um, y minus x in the gradient, and this is like the square term of y minus x by itself, and for minimizing this over y, we can add in any terms we want with x, they don't matter. So that actually minimizing this is equivalent to minimizing this. Right, because the cross product between y minus x and t times f of x, I can actually put a 1 over t in front here if that would make you happy. But it doesn't matter, right? Because, again, I can put in anything that doesn't depend on y and doesn't matter. That gives us this, this cross product term here. And when I square this term, it'll give us the y minus x term. And then other terms just depend on x and not y, so it didn't matter. So we're choosing the next point to minimize this f hat, which is our quadratic approximation. Well, how do we minimize this? We just choose our next point to be this, right? If we want to minimize this over y, we would just choose y to be this exactly. So the update looks like this. And that's exactly the gradient descent update. Right? So you can think about it like minimizing a quadratic approximation to the function. So here's a picture of that. 
let's suppose this, this solid line is our true function and this dotted line is, is the quadratic, our quadratic approximation and our current iterative is, is the blue point. So what we do is we make a quadratic approximation around x and we minimize that quadratic approximation. That takes us to our next gradient step. Right, so we would have chosen this red point. Are there any questions about that? Is that clear? I'm sorry, it's hard for me to hear because of the... Yeah? Um, so if I use an L1 norm, first of all, uh, actually there would be an explicit expression for that. Not if I square it though. Um, the question is whether that will work. Uh, that actually will work because it's called a majorization algorithm. So there's a class of algorithms that's called a minimization majorization algorithms. We might learn that later. I don't know if we'll cover that. But we won't have the same convergence guarantees. It would, get, it would be non-decreasing. It would go downhill, but we won't have a guarantee about how fast it would converge. So the L2 norm is nice because it gives us a, a very kind of controlled convergence rate. Other questions? That was a good question. Okay, so what's today's outline? Today we're going to talk about choosing the step size, which is something we didn't really talk about before. Um, we're going to talk about what does convergence look like under a good step size, and we're going to define what, what that means precisely, what is a good step size. We're going to look at what convergence looks like under strong convexity. That's a condition we learned last time. Basically means that um, our function can be lower bounded by a quadratic. Right? It's, it's curved enough that we can actually draw a quadratic underneath it at every point. And then we're going to talk about connections to statistical algorithms. So there's a lot of nice connections between gradient descent and stuff in statistics that goes by different names. And you're going to, you have a problem on the homework that involves um, doing steepest descent with the one norm for the graphical lasso. And we'll, we'll cover the connection between gradient descent and these kind of stage-wise algorithms today for a different problem, not the graphical lasso. And the homework, you're going to explore that. Okay, so let's just go through some examples to see what step size does. Right? We should probably explore what, what step sizes do before we go and we try to work out the math But what a good step size is. Let's just go look at what happens if we take different, different step sizes. So here's an example where my function was a quadratic. Okay, it actually was 10x squared, x1 squared plus x2 squared. And I just divided by 2 to make the derivatives easier. And these are the contours in R2. Okay, so it, ha it has these elliptical contours. And the minimum is at zero, right? So I want to get to zero. And let's suppose I start gradient descent at this point up here. And I start it with a pretty big step size. So here I actually let t be pretty large. So what happens? Well, the first step looks pretty good, kind of. And then we take too far of a step. So now we're outside of, we actually have increased the function. We've gone in, in terms of, we've gone outwards from the contour, so that's increasing the function value. And then we start doing this chaotic oscillation thing, and we might get close to passing through zero with a step, but we're not going to get to zero. So this, it actually diverged here. And not only that, it wasn't actually a descent algorithm here. We call it gradient descent, but we weren't descending, right? We were actually ascending here. So too big is bad. If we have a too big step size, there's no guarantees that it'll even descend, let alone converge. Okay, look, what happens if we take t really small? So here I took t to be really, really tiny. And I took 100 steps from this point. And it barely got halfway. So it wasn't bad, it was safe. It looked like it was going the right direction. It was actually decreasing the function, but it was slow. So we'd rather kind of avoid that, right? We don't want to have to turn t down so slow, so small that it takes a million steps to get to the optimum. Okay, here's an example where I just took 40 appropriately sized steps. How did I know what the step sizes were? How did I know what an appropriate choice of step size was? Well, you'll get a very precise answer when we go through the convergence analysis later. But I chose a step size based on um, what I knew was good, because I wrote the lecture notes. And I got, to, I got to zero after 40 steps within a very small tolerance. Okay, So it's kind of like this phenomenon of this porridge is too hot, this is too cold, this is just right. Right, so if we make it too big, it's, it's really bad. It diverges too small, it's slow. And if it's just right, it seems to perform very well. But we don't want to be always kind of fiddling with this in practice. We want to have some more principled ways of choosing step sizes. 
So like I said, the convergence analysis later will give us a better idea of how to choose step sizes. In all these examples, the step size was fixed. Okay, so I chose the same step size at each iteration. And our first convergence theorem will tell us how to choose a good fixed step size. Here's another idea about how to choose a step size, but instead of making it fixed, how to do it adaptively. And it's called backtracking line search. It works very well in practice. It's very commonly used. And we also have a convergence theorem for this too, so we know, it work, it, we know it's not going to fail us, at least um, in theory. So how does it work? Well, before we even start the algorithm, we actually fix two parameters. We fix alpha and beta. Alpha we fix to be smaller than a half, and beta we, we fix to be smaller than one. They're both positive. And then at each iteration, instead of just using t, we're going to start at t equals 1, and we're going to actually iterate some criterion until we find a good value of t, and then we're going to go with that value of t and make the gradient update. So what do we iterate? We evaluate the function f at the proposed gradient update, x minus t times the gradient. And we're going to ask, is that bigger than f of x minus alpha times t times the norm of the gradient squared? Okay, so that doesn't look totally natural right now, but in the next slide we're going to see a picture that's going to explain why this works. Okay, so this is basically saying, I don't want to accept a gradient step if it doesn't decrease the function value by a big enough amount. And this is the, this is the amount by which I want to decrease the function value, right? So while that's too big, we're going to keep multiplying t by beta t, where beta is less than 1, so we're going to be keeping on decreasing t. And then when this passes, we're just going to say, okay, I like that t, and we're going to take the gradient step and go on to the next iteration. So it's simple and it tends to work pretty well in practice. So here's an interpretation of that. I took this picture from your book, actually, your textbook. So let's suppose that we're at x here. This is the current x. And I'm going to draw the tangent line to my function. Right? And we actually know from convexity this always underestimates the function. Because f is convex, this actually lies below our function everywhere. So in, in, in this picture here, the direction we're moving is called delta x. For us, delta x is always the minus gradient. So just always think of delta x as minus the gradient of f. So this is the, the tangent line along this direction, delta of x, to the function. Okay? And there's going to be some value of t at which if we multiply this by alpha, so this is a little bit too strict, right? We can't say we want to do as well as the function value down here because we know it always underestimates the function. So let's say alpha was a half. That means that we're going to kind of decrease the slope of this line by 50%. And we're going to say, okay, let's, let's look at 50% of the tangent line. There's going to be some value of t at which if we take a, a set size smaller than that, our function is going to actually be decreased smaller than that linear approximation at 50% of the tangent line slope. So this is going to be our baseline for how much we want to decrease the function, alpha times the slope from the tangent line. And we're going to want to keep decreasing t until our next gradient update is going to beat that baseline. So maybe we propose t out here, and we evaluate we propose t so that the gradient steps out here, and we evaluate the function, and it's too large. It's actually larger than, the linear pro than this baseline linear approximation. So we multiply t by some factor less than 1, we keep multiplying it until we're in this region, where we've actually beaten that linear approximation. Okay, so it's, it's very simple, and it tends to work well. So let's talk about the effects of alpha and beta. What happens if I choose beta to be pretty small, like 0.2 or something? Beta can be anything less than 1. What do, you think, what do you think happens if I choose beta to be pretty small? Ideas? Right. That was, that's a good point. So if, if, we, if beta is really small, like 0.2, and we start out off here, if we multiply t by beta t, we might decrease t too quickly. Might end up out here. Right? So it's aggressive to make beta small, but we might end up shooting ourselves in the foot and going too quickly past this point t0 that we want to get ideally. Then again, if beta is too close to 1, we're just going to be kind of inching along and we're going to repeat that test many times. Okay, so there's some trade-off there. What about alpha? What happens if alpha is... Well, actually, we're going to see we can't make alpha any larger than a half. Because if we make alpha larger than a half, we can't actually prove conversions. What happens if we make alpha too small?
Ideas? Uh, so if you make alpha too small, right, if you make alpha very small, then this line is going to be very, what do we think, flat or steep? Flat, right. right. So if alpha is too small, this line is very flat, which means that we don't really have a very good baseline for how much to decrease the function by. Right? Almost anything we take is going to actually achieve that. And if alpha is too close to half, then maybe it'll get more and more difficult. So there are some default choices for alpha and beta that are recommended by um, Boyd and Vandenberg in your book. I think that they recommend alpha between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3 and beta between 0.1 and 0.8. Those are pretty wide ranges. Like I said, they, they actually tend to, depending on the problem, some values of alpha and beta can work better or worse. Here I, I did backtracking for our example, and after only 13 steps, it found uh, zero within a very small tolerance. So it did much better than our fixed T algorithm too, right? You can see it kind of, it did the right thing in terms of adaptively picking up the step size. It made big steps at the start and it made them smaller at the end when we were trying to be more careful about trying to find the optimum. Yeah? Did you, did you count how many function evaluations you got? Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, Jeff asked, did I count how many function evaluations that I, I used here? Because you can see that if I'm repeating this many times, I'm actually having to evaluate the function many times. And it's great, well, it's grading only once, but the function many times. I didn't count how many uh, evaluations of the function I made, but that's a good point. All right, so even though I took 13 steps, each of these could have required three iterations, in which case I would have taken um, 39 steps, right? 39 total function evaluations. And I took about 40 steps with gradient descent, each of which was a function evaluation, so they might have been compatible. And that's going to be a very good point later when we actually start talking about non-smooth methods and when these gradient updates are going to be more costly, there's going to be a big difference in terms of um, it's not going to be so trivial to evaluate the function. So that, that'll be a good point. We'll have to pay attention to that later. So what else can you do? We can do something called exact line search. This is the third option, which is at each iteration, we can actually look to minimize another problem, which is that if I just restrict f along a line defined by the negative gradient, let me choose the step size that minimizes that. So this is very greedy. It says, I know I have to move along the direction of the negative gradient. Let me just choose the, the amount along that direction to minimize the function. So first of all, why is this well posed? Why does this always have a minimum, this min minimization problem here? What's that? It's affine. Well, no, because f could be non-affine, right? f could be a quadratic. So think of convexity. I'm always kind of calling convexity so important, but here's another reason. So one of the things, did we learn this? Maybe we didn't learn it, so maybe I'm being unfair. One of the properties of convex functions is that if you restrict them to any line along the space, they're convex in that univariate amount. So this function is actually convex in S for a fixed X. So any convex function evaluated along a line through space is convex. So this minimization problem does have a minimum. So it's not like there are multiple S we could choose. It's usually not possible to actually do this minimization exactly. So in many, many instances, exact line search is, is, is just infeasible. It's not used. Um, there are some cases in which you can do it exactly. Actually, quadratic functions are cases in which you can usually do it exactly. But even when you can do it exactly, it usually does not outperform backtracking search by very much. So it tends not to be used in practice. The default is usually to use backtracking, or if you have other reasons, to use a fixed step size that's, um, that's well controlled. OK, so now we're going to get to the first kind of thing we prove in this class. We're going to prove that after k iterations, if we assume that the gradient of our function is Lipschitz, that gradient descent decreases at a rate of 1 over k. And we're going to make that precise with this theorem. So first, we're going to assume that f is convex and it's differentiable. And on top of that, we're going to assume that its gradient is bounded by L times x minus y if we evaluate the gradient at two different points, x and y. So this is called Lipschitz. Remember, we learned this uh, last time in class. Okay? And one thing that uh, is important to keep in mind 
is that a Lipschitz function is differentiable almost everywhere. So you can think about Lipschitz functions as differentiable. So if I say that the gradient of f is Lipschitz, it really means that f also has a second derivative. So I can also write down its Hessian matrix. And this condition is equivalent to saying that the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is L. So I think we learned this notation in class, the curly brace notation. But when I say that a matrix A is bigger than or equal to zero with this curly inequality sign, I mean that A is positive semi-definite. So I mean that for any vector x, x transpose AX is positive. Okay? If I say that um, A is positive semi-definite, it's also the same as saying that A's smallest eigenvalue is non-negative. Okay? So this condition actually says that the, the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian is at most L. That's, that's equivalent to being Lipschitz. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right, so this has to be a matrix. I want this to make sense. So if I multiply L times identity, that's really what I want. OK, so with this condition on the gradient of F, we can prove a theorem. And the theorem is that if we use a fixed step size T that's less than or equal to 1 over that Lipschitz constant, then after k iterations, no matter where I start, well, actually, the bound is going to depend on where I start, so let me take that back. After k iterations, if I start at x0, the value of my function at xk minus the, the smallest value of the function at the value of the function at its minimum is at most the difference between where I started and this, the optimal solution x star divided by 2 times t times k. OK, so the, really the take home message here is this k in the denominator. Right, for a given problem, if I fix t and I fix x0, if I keep iterating, then I'm going to decrease the function value at a rate of 1 over k. That's what this means. So we, the way we say this is that gradient descent has a convergence rate of 1 over k. And another way of saying that is if I want to get with an epsilon of the optimal solution, I need 1 over epsilon iterations. Right, that's very easy. That's just like saying if this is less than or equal to epsilon, the right-hand side, what does k have to be? Well, k has to be about 1 over epsilon to get that. So what happens if L is huge? If our function is Lipschitz, but it has a huge Lipschitz constant? So what do you think? Is that, is that harder or worse to minimize? A function is Lipschitz, but it, it's the bound on its Lipschitz constant is very big. That means it could have a very drastic slope, right? Its gradient can change drastically. I mean, it's still, it's still bounded by a linear function, but it's a bigger linear function. OK, well, that means that t has to be smaller than equal to something very small. So we have to take very small steps. OK, so we have to be careful if the function has a big slope. That's all it's saying. Because right? if we overstep, it could be bad. If L is large, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right. if L is large, that's, that's the condition. If L is very small, then we can take bigger steps, right? Because we're not going to do as much damage by stepping with big steps. That's the intuition. OK, so we're going to actually prove this. And then afterwards, I think we'll take a, probably a quick break, because proofs are always hard. It's always hard for me, too, no matter how easy it may seem. So. Um, there are some key steps to go through. So the first step is that I claim that if, if the gradient is Lipschitz with a constant L, then actually we can upper bound the function by a quadratic everywhere. Right, so we know that from convexity, we can lower bound it by a linear function. That's just convexity. But I claim that if the gradient is actually Lipschitz, we can upper bound it by a quadratic. So why is that true? Well, if I have any x and y, there's something called the Taylor remainder theorem that tells me that actually, if, if you give me any x and y, 
I can actually write y as exactly a quadratic function of x, provided that the quadratic term I plug in is z, where z lies on the line segment between x and y. Okay, so this notation from the x, x and y are vectors, it means that I'm actually drawing a line between x and y, and there's something called the Taylor remainder theorem which says that I can always write f, of f as a quadratic function around x for a given y, as long as I just plug in instead of y here, some z that's in the line segment between x and y. So that's called Taylor remainder theorem. So when you, le when you learned the Taylor Taylor's theorem or Taylor series in high school calculus, you probably learned this too, but it would have been one dimension. Okay, so now what do I know? I know that actually I told you that the gradient of f, right, it's, 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 it's biggest eigenvalue is at most l. Okay, so what does that mean by definition of what this inequality sign means? It means that I can take any x and y and I can multiply it by this gradient matrix minus L times I and that has to be positive. Thank you. Okay. That's what this means. So what does this mean? It means that if I actually rewrite it, the squared norm between um, right, it means that L times the squared norm between X and Y, right, is always less than or equal to X minus Y transpose and uh, nobody caught me here I actually got this inequality backwards or probably people caught me but didn't want to say something right, that should have been less than equal to zero because I had this was less than equal to that so this is actually also backwards Okay, so actually there's multiple forms of the Taylor remainder theorem. I was actually quoting something called the, the I think it was called the, the Cauchy version. There's a different version which I actually wanted to use, which is that I can put in this quadratic term. Okay, I take x minus y, I inner product with the gradient matrix at z, times x minus y, and this equality holds. So this is the version of the Taylor remainder theorem I wanted. Okay, so now what I do, I just go ahead and I plug in this inequality here. So this holds for any z and x and y, and I get that first step. Okay, so we just established that if the function, what's that? Thank you. I should really start drawing that, doing this in pencil, huh? Okay, so modulo all the inequality signs being wrong, because I flip them all around. We have that f is smaller than or equal to a quadratic function of x at any y, where the, the quadratic term is multiplied by our Lipschitz constant. That's the first key step, okay? What's the second key step? Well, we're just gonna plug in, as I said up here, we're gonna plug in y equals x minus t times the gradient. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see where that takes us. What's that? Raise it, thank you. 
Okay? So this tells us that when I plug in our grading update, I start at f of x, and now what's, what's y minus x in this case? y minus x is just exactly um, t times the gradient, right? So I'll get t times the gradient here, plus l over 2 times their difference squared. My what's their difference squared? Well, again, it's, it's t times the gradient squared. Thank you. I really should use a pencil. Next time, I will use a pencil. OK, so what is this? This is f of x minus 1 minus l times t over 2 times t times the norm of the gradient squared. OK, that's the second key step. OK, now we're going to use the fact that we look at this and we say, well, when can we make it so that the function decreases if we look at this? We want to make it so the function actually goes down. So let's try taking t less than or equal to 1 over l. So if I take that to be true, then this term here, 1 minus l times t over 2, right, this is bigger than or equal to 1 minus 1 over 2, which is a half. Right? So because I have a negative sign in front here, that actually means that f of x plus, remember this thing was x plus, it was our next gradient step, is smaller than or equal to f of x plus minus 1 over 2t times the gradient of f of x squared. So look, ah, we've actually proven that if we take in the, the step to be smaller than 1 over l, we actually decrease the function every iteration. That's at least a start, right? We're actually descending. The next iteration, we're at f of x minus something that's at least non-negative. Okay? Here? That was this t. Oh, sorry, you're right. Thank you. So now we're going to use the fact that f is convex. So remember, we can always write for a convex function. Let's do a little side thing here. If I take a, a x star, I can always do a linear approximation around x. times x minus x star, or sorry, All right, this is my usual definition of convexity. I can take a, a linear approximation around any point and it'll lower bound the function, so let's just try that at x star actually. Another way of saying that is that if I flip this around, that f of x is smaller than or equal to f of x star plus the gradient of f of x times x minus x star. Right, so I'm going to actually use that inequality right here to continue bounding this, because I want to get this in terms of x star. Right, that's the goal. I don't want to, I want to kind of get past this, it, this iterate. So I'm going to plug in that, and I get f of x star plus the gradient transpose x minus x star minus that same quadratic term I had. OK, 
Okay, now we're going to do the same trick that we did when we looked at the prox function. We're going to look at this and we're going to say, okay, this kind of looks like the cross product between two things, and then there's like a linear term as well. So, th so this is the cross product, and this is the square term. So we're going to try to make this look like I'm taking the, the Euclidean norm squared of some differences. Okay, but now we're going to have to be a little more clever when we do that. I'm going to write it out for you, and then you can, we can talk through it. Okay, so I claim this is actually equal. Let's go through it. Well, these, uh, if I take x minus x star squared and this x minus x star squared from here, they cancel, so there's no more of that. That's, that's fine. What happens when I take this term squared? Right, then I get actually t squared times the gradient of f of x squared, but I'm dividing by 1 over 2t, and there's a minus sign here, so I get minus t over 2 times the gradient squared, which is what I had before. That's good. And now all that's left is the cross product between these two terms. And that's exactly this, right? I have a 2t here, and I have a 2t down there, and they cancel. OK, so that's good. And now the, the thing that we noticed is that um, this and this, that's actually our next x. That was x plus. So this term here we can write as x plus minus x star squared. So now we're very close and we've almost proved it. Just going to recap what we had written down. What we just proved was that at x plus, which is our next gradient update, it was less than f of x star plus 1 over 2t times how far x is from x star minus how far x plus is from x star squared. OK? That's pretty good. We're almost there. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually say, well, let's just sum this over all iterations. OK, so we want to look what happened at the kth iteration. This is true at any given iteration. So that means that if we sum over iterations i from 1 through k, and we look at the difference between xi minus f of x star, then we can bound that by 1 over 2t times the sum from i equals 1 to k of xi minus 1 minus x star right, because that was the previous x minus xi minus x star squared. Okay? And next thing, notice that this is actually a telescoping sum, right? Because at the i before this, I also have an i minus 1, but it's negative. So if I, and this sum telescopes, right, so I end up with all that's left over was the smallest term. Minus the biggest term. And I'm just going to throw that away. Because I want to make an upper bound. I'm subtracting something positive. Let's just throw that away. OK, so now we're very close. We've said that the sum over all iterations is at the most 1 over 2t times the difference from the point that we started minus x star. But we want to actually bound the function value at xk, not at all the different xi's. So then we have one more step to say, well, we actually claim, we say, well, f of xi is non-increasing. Right? Why was that true? It's because well, we actually just proved that a little while ago, that if we take t less than or equal to 1 over l, we always decrease the function value. So that's good. So therefore, the difference between where I am at xk and, and x star 
is less than or equal to 1 over k times the sum of the differences that I am, right? It's less than the average distance over the iterations. And from our work just a little while ago, we just showed that was equal to that. Okay, so that, that's our final result there. So let's, let's go back and let's pause and think about what were the key steps here, because it might have looked like a lot all in a row. So I'll try to point them out both on paper and on this slide. Okay, so first key step is this one. Okay, we need, we need some bound on how large f can grow around x. Right, because we're trying to bound the difference between where it gets at xk, so we need some bound. That's where the Lipschitz bound comes in. Lipschitz is a way that tells us that we can provide a quadratic bound on f at any point or on x. Okay, the next really, really crucial point was actually right here. This one right here. Okay, we said that actually we can decrease the function value at every duration, and not only that, we can decrease it by t over 2 times the norm of the gradient squared. Now, what does this look like to you that we just saw a little while ago? I'll give you a hint. What happens if I replace this, this 2 with the, this 1 half by an alpha? Different ways to choose the step size. We had fixed, and we also had backtracking. So we put an alpha here. This is actually the exit condition for backtracking tells me that backtracking will stop when this is true. So we control the step size so we can make this true. But look, backtracking actually aims to make this condition true at every t, because alpha is less than a half. Right, so it makes, it, it makes this true for alpha, so it's certainly going to be true for a half. OK? OK, so now we can actually see that uh, if we actually just went through backtracking, we can pretty much start with here, right? Because this is a condition that backtracking satisfies by definition at every t. We also have this. This is just a Lipschitz condition. So the proof should really just be the same. Does everyone buy that? That we should get the same result? You don't buy that. OK, so what are, what are we missing that we still need? We're not actually really missing anything. So if we were to stick in alpha here, that's the backtracking condition. And basically, the proof would go through the same way from here, because we didn't use anything about the size of t beyond this. We only use the size of t to ensure this condition. But this condition is ensured by backtracking by definition. Okay, So we're going to get the same convergence result for backtracking. And maybe um, as an exercise, you can, go through with, you can go through the proof carefully and make sure it makes sense to you. Um, we're not going to prove that. I'm just going to state the result. But the proof is very, very similar. So this was the most key result. And we needed the step size, basically, for this to be true. And we also used the Lipschitz condition. From there, it was just a bit of math. We had to fiddle around with um, various ways of expressing f in terms of uh, a function around its minimum. And then we got our result. Okay. Any questions about the proof? It's maybe not something you would have thought of off the top of your head, but if you look through it, I guarantee you, if you look through it a couple times, it won't seem very mysterious. It's very straightforward. Yeah. It's exactly because of this condition here. So the question is, why is f of x non-decreasing? It's because we proved that if we took the step size small enough, at x plus, which is the next iteration, it'll be at most f of x, which is the previous iteration, minus something non-negative. So it has to get smaller at every iteration. Other questions? OK. So this is what I told you we'd see. 
for backtracking, it's the same assumptions. We don't actually have to choose a step size smaller than or equal to the one of the Lipschitz constants to begin with. We just get the same rate, actually, assuming that it's Lipschitz, but not knowing the Lipschitz constant, we get the same rate. OK, so it says that the, func the decrease in the function value goes like 1 over k. Well, what are the constants here? The constants um, are the same as they were before. I had the distance between the initial point and the optimum. I had 2 like I did before. But instead of t, remember t is actually adaptive, so it's different at, at every iteration. I have t min here. And t min is the minimum between 1 and beta over l. So uh, what can we see from this? If beta was tiny, it was really, really, really small, then actually this rate would have degraded, right? Because instead of having a 1 over L, I would have a beta over L in the denominator, which is a lot smaller. So it'll be a bigger by a big constant factor. If beta was close to 1, then the rates are very close to the same up to a constant factor. Okay? And like I said, the proof is very similar. I, I suggest you go home and you try to work through it um, based on what we have for gradient descent. And if you have questions, we can always talk. You can come up, talk to me, or one of the TAs. Maybe we can maybe go through it at some point. If, if a lot of people are confused, we can go through it at some point in more detail. OK, let's take a break. And then we'll come back to some fun connections to statistics. OK, uh, so any questions that came up over the break? You're like, oh, I realized that that was totally wrong, and I want to ask a question. No? Everybody believe that gradient descent actually has that rate? OK, good. Um, we're just going to state a result for strong convexity. We're not going to prove it. It's actually proved in your textbook if you want to look at it. Strong convexity uh, is a condition that we learned last time. It basically says that the smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is uniformly bounded. So if I look at all x, the smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix is lower bounded by, say, d. Okay, I, can, I can also write that condition like this. I can actually lower bound f by a quadratic. Well, from usual convexity, I can lower bound f by a linear function, right? This is convexity. Strong convexity says that actually I can do a little better. I can add a quadratic term to that, and I'll still get a lower bound. So it's a sharper lower bound. And look, this looks extremely similar to Lipschitz bound. Lipschitz, I replace d with an l here. You just prove that. And I replace this with a, a less than equal to sign. So if, it, if both the gradient is Lipschitz and it's strongly convex, then it's upper and lower bounded by quadratics. So we can think about like it's sandwiched by quadratics. And that allows us to prove kind of very strong things about it because we know that it's well behaved. So under the assumption that it's strongly convex and it's Lipschitz, then we have a theorem. And it says that gradient descent is awesome. It does way better than 1 over k. It actually does exponentially well in k. So f of x k minus f of x star is like less than or equal to c to the power of k times um, a term that depends on where we started, where c is some constant less than 1. Okay, so the rate here is actually exponential in k. So um, maybe a bit confusing, but this is actually called linear convergence in the optimization literature, even though it's exponential. And it's because if we plot iterations on the x-axis, and we plot the difference in the function values in the y-axis on a log scale, then it looks like a linear a straight line. That's the reason why. We always just want to plot things. I'm not actually in the optimization community so much. I'm, I'd say I'm straddling the border, so don't get mad at me. But the, the default is to plot the difference in function values on a log scale. Okay, and, and then it looks like a straight line on that plot, and that's why it's called linear conversions. So what does that mean? It means that if we want the difference in function values to be less than or equal to epsilon, we need about on the order of log of 1 over epsilon iterations. So how different is that from 1 over epsilon iterations? It's a huge difference, right? So let's say, let's say epsilon is like, um, let's say it's like 10 to the minus 6, OK? I want to get within 10 to the minus 6 of the optimum. That's pretty ambitious. That's our goal. Then gradient descent needs 1 over 10 to the minus 6 iterations, or 10 to the 6 iterations, right? A lot of iterations. If, if we consider this log to be base 10, which is OK, because logs are all different up to a constant factor anyways, now it's be saying I need 6 iterations. 
Right? So big, big difference between those two convergence rates. So what's the catch here? There's always a catch. The catch is that this constant C depends adversely on the condition number. So the condition number is something that we, is a name we call L over D, the Lipschitz constant divided by the strong convexity parameter. It's actually the condition number of the Hessian matrix, or of the bounds in the Hessian matrix. It's the, uh, our bound on the largest eigenvalue divided by the bound on the smallest eigenvalue. And if that condition number is very high, it's very poorly conditioned, then it's a slower rate. So uh, I think Jeff showed a plot last time of, of some different functions that have different conditioning. You can go back and look at his slides. Just be aware that, that poor conditioning as a very small eigenvalue and a very large eigenvalue can lead to a degraded exponential rate. OK, so just quickly, how realistic are these conditions? We've been throwing them around. They're all mathematical terms. How realistic is the Lipschitz continuity of, of the, the gradient of f? So let's go to one of our favorite problems, which is regression. We're going to ask, is, this Lipsch, is the gradient Lipschitz continuous? OK. Well, better because regression is like the basic problem that we like to solve. And well, let's take the gradient of, of f. Um, maybe just do it very quickly on a piece of paper. If f is 1 half times y minus ax squared, its gradient is like minus a transpose y minus ax. And its second derivative Hessian matrix is um, a transpose a. Right, so saying that f is Lipschitz is like saying that the largest eigenvalue of a is bounded. So actually, a transpose a less than or equal to l i, let's just take l to be the largest singular value of a squared. And that's true. Okay. So if we knew what the largest singular value of a was, or we roughly knew what it was, we could take a constant step size that was 1 over that, and then we get the gradient descent rate. If we didn't know what it was, we could use backtracking, and we would still get the same rate. Right? So that's good. At least it's true for the, the least squares loss. How realistic is strong convexity of f? OK, well, that's not as realistic. Even if we look at our favorite problem, if we go back to our favorite problem, then the gradient, uh, sorry, the Hessian matrix being lower bounded by d is like saying that we need to take d equal to the smallest singular value of a squared. Okay, well, first of all, even if that's non-zero, l over d can be very, very, very large. Right, if a is, is ill-conditioned, which can happen if I have correlated variables if I'm doing my regression over, then it can be very ill-conditioned. Even though I have theoretically an exponential rate, it can have such a bad constant factor that it could look very bad. What happens if A is wide now, if A actually has more columns than rows? So I have more variables and observations in my regression. Then actually, its smallest singular value is 0, so it's not strongly convex. So we don't get uh, the exponential rate for that. And you may say, well, OK, in that case, I wouldn't want to do regression anyways. Right? If, if A has more columns and rows, regression doesn't make much sense. But we're going to see that actually, um, in terms of problems that remedy that, like the lasso or that add a penalty to this, what matters is the gradient of the smooth part, which is always this. Okay, so ev even if I had a penalty, what matters is the gradient of the smooth part. And that's not strongly convex if, it's, if, it's, if you have more variables than observations. Uh, that will become more precise in a, a, a future lecture, but I'm saying that if we had f of x was equal to this regression loss plus something like the L1 penalty of x, then the conditions that matter in terms of smoothness, they all relate to the smooth part. The L1 norm is not smooth, so we're going to be looking at stuff like the Lipschitz constant of the least squares loss, or the, the conve strong convexity of the least squares loss, and in that case, that's a problem we really want to solve, and it's not strongly convex. The, the, the smooth part of that loss, which is like least squares plus penalty, is not strongly convex. OK, so quick recap. Or maybe actually, I told you I'd talk about stopping rules, so I guess 
do that. Um, basic stopping rules look like this. Stop when the gradient is small. Well, why is that reasonable? It's small in magnitude. It's reasonable because at the minimum it's zero, right? So if it's small, we think we're close to the minimum. And all the rules that you'll see that you can read about in your book are derivatives of this. Okay, they just basically use this idea. Later on when we study duality, we're going to see that there's actually a very precise thing you can look at that can guarantee that you that if you stop at x, you're going to be so far from the minimum. That's called the duality gap. And that's a very use that's the reason one of the reasons why it's very useful to study duality. Right now we don't really know what that is yet. But we do know that if f is strongly convex with the parameter d and we stop the algorithm because the norm of the gradient is smaller than or equal to root 2 times c times epsilon, then the difference in function values is at most epsilon. Okay, so if it was strongly convex, then basically if we stop it at something like root epsilon, we're about epsilon away from the, from the optimum. Okay? Pros and cons. So, pro of gradient descent. Simple idea, each iteration is cheap. We just have to evaluate a gradient. There's no second derivative evaluations. There's no uh, linear systems we have to solve. All we're doing is we evaluate the gradient, we take an inner product, and then we do some addition. That's it. Or subtraction. Subtract multiple of that from the, from the previous iterate. Very, very cheap. Very easy to implement. As long as you know what the gradient is, you can do gradient descent. Another pro. Um, if the problem's well conditioned and strongly convex, so if it's strongly convex and L over D is not too big, it's very fast. So now we know actually we have at least one algorithm that if somebody said I have a very smooth function that's, that has very good conditioning, what do I do? The answer is gradient descent because at an exponential rate. So that's about as, as good as you can do. Con. Uh, it's often slow because the problems that we want to look at most of the time, or a lot of interesting problems, they aren't strongly convex, or even if they are, they're not well conditioned. So gradient descent can be improved. It's pretty slow, and we're going to see that. Another con is that it can't handle non-differentiable functions. Right, the moment I throw in something that I can't, do the, can't take the gradient of, we're stuck, at least for now. So Thursday, we're going to talk about this, non-differentiable functions. And next Tuesday and Thursday, we're going to talk about speeding it up. So we're going to address both of those cons. OK, so here's a fun connection to statistics that I wanted to point out, because it also has something to do with your homework. So you should pay attention, because you'll learn how to do the homework problem if you listen to this. Let's go back to the regression example. I want to minimize this function, f of x is equal to y minus ax squared. OK, and I'm thinking of a as having columns a1 through ap that are my predictor variables. Then there's an algorithm called forward stage-wise regression, which you probably have heard of. It's very similar to forward step-wise regression, which we learned uh, like in one of the first lectures. And it's as follows. I start with um, x0 being equal to 0, and I repeat the following steps. I find the variable i from 1 to p, such that ai transpose r is, is largest in absolute value, where r is the residual vector. So I look at the residual y minus a, ax to the power of uh, the iterate from the previous iteration, y minus ax. And I see which variable is, it has the highest inner product with that residual and absolute value. If I happen to just have a, if I uh, scaled and centered its columns, that would be the highest absolute correlation. So you can think of it like that. I say which variable is, is most correlated with the residual. The residual is what I haven't explained yet. So I take that i and I update it. Only that component i, no other components of x, and I add to it a small multiple gamma times the sign of that correlation. Okay, so if the tenth variable is positively correlated with the residual, I add a very small multiple, positive multiple to the tenth variable. I leave all other variables untouched. So for stepwise regression, instead of adding a small multiple, I actually add the whole thing, and I just I add it to all of the, the I add it to all of the components. So I choose one variable at a time, and I throw it in the model completely. Forward stage-wise regression is much more conservative. It doesn't actually add in the variable into the model completely. It adds in a small multiple of it repeatedly. And I can add in um, a multiple of the same variable many times. I could choose to add a, a small positive component to the tenth variable at some iteration, and then again another iteration, then again another iteration, et cetera. So gamma here is called the learning rate in statistics or machine learning, and it's usually small and fixed. 
the thing to notice is that this kind of looks like gradient descent, right? It looks a little bit like gradient descent because we're adding something to our previous iterate. And actually, it's very much like gradient descent, which we're going to see. So we're going to learn something called steepest descent, which is um, a very natural extension of gradient descent. And you can read about it in the Boyd and Vandenberg book. It's, it was originally proposed to deal with problems that are poorly conditioned. Okay, so if, if the problem is poorly conditioned, and you know the conditioning, then traditionally steepest descent was used for that reason. But we're going to actually learn it because of its connection to forward stage-wise. So let's suppose that Q and R are, are complementary. They're, they're both numbers that are bigger than 1, and I also call them dual. And it means that 1 over Q plus 1 over R is 1. That means that the Q norm and the, and the R norm are dual norms. Okay, and we're, we keep touching on duality, and we're going to have a very serious kind of coverage of duality later, but that's one kind of preview of what it means to be dual if you're a norm. It means that 1 over Q plus 1 over R is 1. So our updates for a steepest center of this form, it's X plus equals X plus T times delta X. In gradient descent, we usually just take the minus gradient, but in steepest descent, we actually choose delta X differently. We first solve this problem. We say, let's take the direction that has the smallest inner product with the gradient, subject to its Q norm being smaller than or equal to 1. That's U. Then I take that U and I, and I scale it by some factor. And the factor I scale it by is its dual norm. Okay? So this normalization isn't so important. That's just a technicality. What happens if Q is 2? If Q is 2, then I say that I want to have the direction that minimizes the inner product of the gradient subject to its 2 norm being smaller than or equal to 1. Well, what direction is that? That's exactly the minus gradient. Right? So we get gradient descent exactly if we take steeper descent with the 2 norm. What happens if Q is 1? Then we say that we want the direction to be the smallest we can make in terms of the inner product of the gradient, subject to its 1 norm being smaller than or equal to 1. Okay, and when we, t when we talk about subgradients in the next lecture, we'll see why this is true. But I claim, actually, that this U is an element of the subgradient of the R norm of the, of the of, um, gradient of f of x. Okay, so that's what that U is, exactly. And we're going to see this next time. We're going to learn all about subgradients. But in the case of the one norm, let's just think about it intuitively. If I say that I have to have components that add up to one absolute value, and I want to uh, maximize the inner product with the gradient, I'm just going to end up taking the largest component of the gradient in absolute value and moving in the negative that direction. So this direction is going to be the ith partial derivative of f in that direction, the minus direction of that, where i maximizes, um, where i is the maximum component of the gradient absolute value. So if I'm constrained to having components that sum up to 1, this v, I'm just going to take the direction with the largest component of the gradient and move in that direction. Okay, in, in normalized steepest descent, it just takes this delta x equal to u, so it doesn't do this rescaling. It always maintains that its q norm would be smaller than or equal to 1. Okay, so now we can see an equivalence. Normalized steepest descent with the 1 norm, that looks like this. I take my, uh, x, my, my current iterate x, and I only update the ith component of that, and I subtract from that t times the sine of the ith component of the gradient, and I call that my new variable x plus. So x plus is identical to x in every component except for the ith one, in which case it's, um, I move along the negative sine of the gradient, where i is the largest component of, delta, of the grad of f of x and absolute value. So that's what normal, normalized steepest descent is uh, for the one norm. What are the forward stage-wise updates? The updates are like this. We saw them before, right? xi plus is equal to xi plus gamma times the sine of the correlation, where r is this residual vector. So now we can see that, well, in this case, our f was the regression loss, right? So its derivative is minus a transpose the residual. And the ith component of its partial derivative is just the ith column of a, inner product with the residual. 
So if I stick that in here, or if, sorry, if I stick that up here, I get exactly four stage wise. So this algorithm that people use in statistics called forward stage wise, it's actually gradient descent. And this gradient descent, or it's, it's called steepest descent, where our norm, instead of being the L2 norm, is the one norm. So it's kind of a, it's a cousin of gradient descent. Now here's a very kind of curious phenomenon. Um, we could run forward stage wise all the way until we got to the least squared solution. That's, that would, is, would be the point of, of using steepest descent. If we want to minimize this least squares function, f, as a function of x, we could just continue this until we get there. But is there any benefit in stopping early? That seems like kind of a bizarre thing to do from the point of view of gradient descent, because the point is to get to the minimum, so why would we stop early? It's kind of like we're under-optimizing or something. But from a statistical point of view, it actually makes a lot of sense. And that's what that forward stage-wise algorithm is, was designed for. We don't run forward stage-wise until we get the least square solution, it's used as a regularization method where the stopping time is, is the tuning parameter. So we may stop it after a certain number of steps, and we've only added components to some of the variables, and therefore we actually we have a sparse estimate for regression. Because if we stop it after, say, 100 iterations, and there's 1,000 variables, we wouldn't have touched at least 900 of the variables, so we'd get a, a vector that has at most 100 non-zero components. But we also had this thing called the lasso, which did that in kind of a more, um, from, more from a more criterion point of view, it actually minimized a penalized problem or a restricted problem where we restricted the L1 norm to be smaller than or equal to T. So that was lasso, and I claim that that was this, you know, great convex invention. And we also have this other thing called forward stage wise, which is like stopping gradient descent early. That's how we can think of it. And they both are ways to give us sparse estimates for regression. So you might ask, well, how do they compare? And the remarkable thing is that you can actually prove that for some problems, which means that for some YNA, with a small enough step size, these are the same thing. They're the same method. Doing gradient descent and stopping early, if I use the one norm, is the lasso. So here I've actually plotted the lasso solution paths as a function of how big that bound is, t, this bound, the L1 norm bound. So each one of these colors is a, is a variable, and you can see as I make t smaller and smaller, they all are shrunk into zero. Right? Here's forward stage-wise, with a very small step size, you can see it has this kind of jigsaw pattern. And I'm plotting as a function of the number of iterations I take of that algorithm. So if I stop it after 100 iterations, it looks very similar to lasso with t somewhere a little bit less than 1. And you can actually prove that as this step size goes to 0, these paths are just exactly these paths. But that's not true for all y and a, it's true for some y and a. And there's actually a very simple modification of forward stage wise, which makes it true for all y and a. So that's pretty cool because this looks like a hard problem, right? If you somebody asked you to solve that and all you have is gradient ascent, you'd say, I don't know, because it's not differentiable. I don't know what to do. But we do know how to do gradient ascent on, on the regression loss by itself. And as long as we kind of stop it at various points, we get the lasso solution paths. So on your homework, you're going to do the same thing, but instead of the lasso, we're going to look at something called the graphical lasso. And you're going to stop that at various points. And you're going to see that that actually behaves a lot like a regularization method, too. So it's a very simple way to minimize L1 penalized or L1 constrained problems. It's just do steepest descent or gradient descent and stop early. Okay, I think that's all the time I have. I have a little more slides on boosting, so we may cover that next time, but um, go ahead and read through those uh, in the meantime. <laughs>